So, I guess we are recording now. Hello world and welcome to the Moodle Community Developer Meeting. It is right now February 17, year 2016. And if you are watching us from recordings, we hope the future is bright and we have good time ahead. Uh, looking at the meeting agenda, at least the following hour or two, looks really, really promising. We have guys from Moodle HQ in Perth present, as well as other Moodle developers going to talk about interesting things tonight. Time flies really quickly. Many things happening daily in the Moodle development world. So let me remind you just a couple of events that happened since the last meeting in October. So we had a couple of Moodle releases. We released Moodle 3 as a new major version, as well as multiple stable updates, like minor versions. Currently supported versions are Moodle 3 and Moodle 2.9, with uh, security updates and data loss fixes, like data loss bugs are being supported for both 2.8 and 2.7 long-term supported version. Moodle uh, started to support PHP 7 officially with, uh, with the recent Moodle 301. Uh, we, uh, the, the Moodle User Association is now open for membership as a new event from, from past three months. Uh, we will hear a bit more about, uh, about the association from Martin later. As well as Moodle, also Moodle Mobile App, uh, saw so several several regular updates from 2.4 up to 2.8, and big thanks to, to our Moodle Mobile team uh, and Juan and others uh, working on our app, which is seeing a lot of new great features with every release, and we will again uh, hear more about it today. Uh, we finally, we, we also saw some progress with Travis, continuous integration. Uh, support. We Moodle now supports both Moodle now supports Travis integration for both core patches as well as plugin development, and we have a nice documentation that uh, that describes the steps. It's pretty easy, and every Moodle developer is really encouraged to try and set up this uh, this integration. It helps both uh, with both core patches and with uh, Moodle plugins. Uh, we have. We have some upcoming uh, development related events. Uh, the most of the uh, the most upcoming one is the Hackfest, which is going to happen in London uh, during the Moodle Mood, uh, Moodle Mood UK, Ireland UK uh, there on uh, March 22nd. So everybody who, who is able to come, you, are, you will be very welcome, uh, welcome there. Uh, Moodle applied for being Google Summer of Code uh, hosting organization again this year. Uh, we should have results available by the end of February and we will inform you uh, as needed. So what's up for, for today's meeting? We will hear some, some short information about, uh, about Moodle Users Association and Moodle Developer course coming. We will see a first prototypes and background information about a new feature coming with Moodle 3.1, which is called competency-based education. We will hear some information about improvements with reusable element uh, for uh, inline name editing, just to be aware that this API is, uh, this API is now available, as well as uh, forms library improvements, text API, and uh, other small things that we should be aware of uh, with recent Moodle versions. Tim Hunt will present some recent changes to the quiz module that themers and theme designers should be aware of. And Juan will present us with plans for supporting Moodle plugins in the mobile app. Uh, let, me, let me pass the micro microphone to Perth in Australia, where Martin the Gamer should be prepared to present, to continue with his first talk. I'm going to make you presenter now, Martin. Hello. Beth, can you hear us? Uh, here we go. Now I'm unmuted. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you okay as well as others. Um, should I try sharing a webcam as well? I don't have any slides. Sure, sure. you can. Yeah, please mm -hmm. do so.
There we go. Yes, Hi, good to you. Hi. Thank you, David. Uh, I, I am loving how you're running these meetings and um, yeah, thank you for, for, for the introduction and putting it together. Um, so look, I, I just wanted to uh, uh, talk for a minute or two about a couple of things. Um, so the first one's the Moodle User Association. Uh, like David said, finally launched. Um, it's really been a year in the making. Uh, there's been a lot of planning uh, about it, a lot of um, uh, details worked on, the, the whole structure of it and so on. And to see it finally launched and functioning as it is, it's really amazing. Um, there's nearly 100 members now uh, and they there's probably quite a few more who are still going through the invoicing process um, to come. Uh, that this, the members are already engaged and um, already starting to do the thing they're meant to be doing, which is um, proposing projects for Moodle Core and working on those um, uh, requirements. And then after this first six month period in around June, um, the, the process will have worked its way through and some chosen projects get passed to Moodle HQ to develop. Um, it's it's a new thing. I, I have not seen any model quite like it in the other project, so it's new, but I have full faith that it's going to work. I really have a really good feeling about how it's going so far. Uh, the committee have been doing a great job um, that we put, uh, that we, we selected with Nick Thompson at the head. Um, but the first voting will happen later this year uh, and from then on the association will choose its own committee. So there were some questions about how that works with developers and development in general. So the, the core development uh, in the, uh, the rules of the association does go to Moodle HQ. If you're not at Moodle HQ, you may be wondering where, I, where do I fit in here. I want to point out a couple of things. Firstly, this is additional stuff to everything else that is already happening. So everything that was already happening in the tracker and the forums and everywhere else and here continues to and will do so. The association are paying for extra developers basically to do extra work. Um, secondly, you can still take part in this because it is quite exciting. Um, if you want to get involved, um, you can become a member and get involved actually in the association. Um, and with a developer background, you'll have a good perspective on uh, helping to shape the requirements and make sure they're realistic and so on. Um, so that's uh, one way. Um, another way you can actually help there is by producing prototypes or mock-ups or, um, you know, um, ideally if we at the end get um, code um, that is reasonably, that is good code, hopefully excellent code, um, that really helps us. It'll make it a much easier and cheaper job uh, to get that into Moodle Core. So the association will be paying less. Um, <clears throat> the actual location of the requirements and the discussion of what's being worked on doesn't have to be inside the Moodle Association website. It's a privilege of the members to be able to do it there. Um, but they can choose to put it out and be more transparent and be anywhere they want to. And anybody starting a project can can do that. Um, uh, you know, there's no rule saying everyone must keep it secret or anything like that. It's definitely open. And once the projects actually get submitted to Moodle HQ, once they're decided on, uh, they get put into the Moodle tracker in a uh, public place. So if you look on the Moodle tracker under the MUA project, uh, you'll see there is one issue there right now. And that was the very first issue from the association that was chosen, which was to integrate the recycle bin plugin, which is from the community. Sorry, I've forgotten the developer's name, but pretty high quality coding, uh, a good plugin, and we're integrating it into core. There's a few core things to, uh, to do as well, and so obviously a lot of integration and, and testing, but um, that's the first example, and there'll be many more of it. So. Um, I see Nick Thompson's here, so uh, I guess Nick, uh, you won't mind me saying they can always contact you if they have any more questions.
Yeah, that's yeah, that's, that's, that's correct. It's correct. It is one. So, so, uh, no more information from back from the Moodle Mood or not from the Moodle Association. Uh, please feel free to contact me, and I can help out with whatever uh, questions you have or anything of that nature. I'll put my email in the chat. Cool. Uh, the that's it. Is there any other? Uh, I'm going to get I'm going to get out of here so you can listen to everyone else. The uh, the other thing I wanted to say was that um, uh, I just wanted to let everyone know that we are planning uh, on updating our uh, Moodle development support. If you look at this the site where we're in now, we were in uh, dev.moodle.org. There is a course there to learn how to start Moodle programming. Um, it's based on Moodle 1.8, and it just takes you through a block, mostly. Um, it's very outdated. Moodle has evolved a lot since then, um, and it's time we address that. So I'm just letting you know that uh, we are planning to dedicate some time to Moodle HQ uh, to get a lot of people together to develop um, something a lot better than that. Um, so no details yet, but, uh, but just so you know that that's in the wings and uh, something we hope to have happening within the next uh, month or two. So hopefully by the next meeting, um, there'll be something to talk about there. Cool. All right, thanks. Back to David. Cheers, all. Thank you very much, Martin, for, for his great news and updates, as well as, uh, uh, as, well as uh, uh, Nick for, for contact details for the Moodle User Association. Yeah, I agree that uh, there's some, some sort of tutorial courses for Moodle development. It would be a great enhancement to have and to offer to our community developers, as it is something that we are often asked for. And yeah, there will be great improvements. Uh, Tim Hunt is asking who is going to write the dev course. As far as I know, there will be uh, uh, there will be basically core core developers from HQ working on it initially. With I suppose uh, I suppose that the community will be then again involved somehow in further improvements of the course and everything. Yeah, so HQ will do a sprint on it to to get started, and we will see how it goes. Great. So uh, that was there were there was some news from uh, from Martin. If anybody else is uh, is going to is curious about things or details behind, please uh, see all the resources and links. Uh, let's move on to uh, Damon, who is going to present us with this competency-based education feature of framework uh, or API that is going to land in Moodle Moodle three one. So uh, Damon. You are now presenter. Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me fine. Yep. That's good. So um, what I wanted to talk about is firstly to talk a little bit about the competency-based education feature that we've been working on. Um, and then uh, I wanted to sort of only briefly touch on the features of it and then um, jump into some kind of developer notes of things that we've done uh, when we were writing the code and things that we found because um, we used a lot of new JavaScript systems and templates and all sorts of things uh, when we were building this feature and I thought it would be useful to sort of um, just uh, yeah give you a note of some things that we thought were good and uh, and also just a background on how the, that new block of code is structured because um, uh, there are a lot of things in there which uh, are a bit different to how things have been done in the past. Now I'm just looking for the screen share button if anybody can help me out. Uh, it should be in the left top corner. Once you are presenting. Uh, yes. 
Okay, how did that go? Did that end up working? I just accepted some Java dialogue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it takes time in um, the blue button to actually make it make it happening, but it works now. Thanks, Damon. Okay, I think I can see it now. Good. Okay, so um, that I'll quickly do is just quickly show on the dev sites. Uh, so what we've set up, if anybody's interested in looking at the CVE, um, is that we have the prototype sites set up on this uh, Moodle prototype at moodle.net. And from uh, a couple of uh, example uh, in an education environment and an example in a workplace environment. So the differences between those are the frameworks that have been set up and uh, just some of the information about the users and the course um, example content. But so if I log into this, um, uh, I've already logged into this one, so I'm an admin. Uh, I'll just give you a very quick walkthrough over the features in CBE. So um, the first thing is that at that level, you set up these uh, competences, which is like a, a long list of uh, competent uh, standard, and they're organized as a competencies. So each node in the tree has parents. Um, and you can drill down to different levels in the tree uh, and right down to the leaves, which um, we'll show you it has a code and it's sort of saying um, you do these things to achieve the, the competency. So you start with the framework, which is this structured tree, and then you create a learning plan template from the tree. Just a list of a specific set of competencies that you want a group of users to achieve. So I've got this year one template, which will have some competencies in the list. And so the learning plan template is so that I can assign the same template to lots of different. Uh, and then if I apply, uh, all of the users' learning plans will get automatically updated. So they get kept in sync uh, just by managing everything from a template. Uh, you also have the option of creating plans for individual users um, don't have a template and they won't be automatically updated. So once you've got these structures set up site-wide and outside of a course, um, then the teacher decide a course, they will list all of the competencies that belong to that. Um, so they can choose those competencies from any framework on the site. Uh, they can also set these automatic to either course completion or activity completion. So when something gets completed, it will either attach an evidence or will actually complete the competency um, or send it for review. So that way, uh, Lots of different people have different use cases for using competency-based education. Um, some of them want to mark everything manually and have uh, certain people do the abuse. And some people want to have it as automated and hands-off as possible. So um, it's sort of flexible uh, in the way that you set it up. And then uh, when you are in a course, you can see Uh, for each user competencies, and you can uh, all in. So, Sorry, Damon, can I interrupt for a while? Yes. Uh, we are losing sound a bit. 
and uh, I have an idea. Maybe you could try to make the window that you are sharing a bit smaller, because every time you know the page needs to be redrawn. Uh, we are getting, uh, we are losing the audio probably due to bandwidth problem. So maybe the the less changes we can uh, that can be shared, the, the better, I guess. Sure, I'll just switch that now. Um. I'm not sure how that uh, sharing tool works. Yeah, I if I remember part of the screen. Can, yeah, you can share just the just the whole screen, whole desktop, or just a region on it of it, something like that. There was an option for it. If it doesn't doesn't work, I, I'm pretty sure we can continue just trying, you know, to to click as as not not that often, so that the actual screen is not redrawn that often. And Tim reports there should be an option to share just one window. Yep. So I think it's just sharing a a small region at the moment. Yeah, I think it looks better. It come up. Okay. Um, so I'm almost finished showing the competency features now. Anyway, um, so yeah, the idea is that you you set up these competencies and they're separate from the grades and gradebook, um, which is an important distinction. So you can you can be graded for activities and receive a score, but whether you've actually achieved the competencies uh, that were linked to that activity are a separate uh, and completely different thing. And uh, the other thing is that the competencies exist outside of a course. So if you achieve a competency in a course, you've achieved that competency even if that course is reset or the course is deleted and you no longer have access to it. Um, all of the evidence that you ever achieve against a competency just keeps building up and building up. And then um, a student has a record of all of the competencies that they've achieved and all of the evidence that they gathered to achieve those competencies. Now, that is a very, very brief overview of the, um, the systems involved. Uh, and if you want more details, um, there's a very detailed spec uh, for the competency work, and you can have a look at the tracker issue. Um, what I wanted to show now is um, just to talk a little bit about some of the design things that we uh, looked at when we were um, building this competency-based education. So, um, let me double check. So that slide show um, on the screen chair fairly well. There's a lot of text in there. Um, so you might need to squint. Uh, but this is sort of an overview of how we designed um, all of the code behind the competency, uh, the CVE feature. So we have, the first thing is that we built this uh, new base class for persistent objects, which takes care of a lot of the tedious work about, um, so basically you just define a list of the properties uh, which map to the columns in the database table and you give, tell them about the types and then you can put um, custom validation uh, on any of the types and uh, you have basically a base class for that particular um, model object. And that means that you get uh, full create, read, update and delete support for that object and it will make sure that all the proper validations are run every time that you call update or create um, and you don't need to manually code all of those things. 
So on top of that layer, we built another API layer, which is a class with a set of static functions. And this is where a lot of the logic and the permission checks are done. But this basically gives you a class that you can call from anywhere and know that you're using the API in a safe way. You're not bypassing permission checks or uh, going to be using the object in the wrong way. Uh, and alongside that API is a model for having exporters. So for each of our persistent objects, when we want to export them for a web service, we want to do it in a consistent way. And all of the additional properties that we want to add um, into mustache templates or into web service functions, um, they always get added in the same way by the same exporter. Um, uh, the exporters are also useful because they can generate the definitions for the web service functions automatically based on the persistent objects. So this saved us a lot of work. Initially, we didn't have the exporters and we found that we were making a lot of simple typos and mistakes when we were trying to write the correct web service definitions. Um, that's one of the things that as we use web services in Moodle more and more, we find that uh, the current way to set up the web service is very tedious and there's a lot of boilerplate code that you need to write every time. So if we can automate that and make it um, easier to build web services, then that, that will be really good. So uh, all of those things together uh, create the model, which is your API um, that you're exposing to the rest of Moodle and to web services and Ajax functions. Uh, and it's a nice consistent model. Um, you can put unit tests on all of the layers, which we've done, and, it, and it's worked really well. Uh, so then we take that API class and we just make external functions for all of the functions in our API class. Um, so, sorry, David, to interrupt again. Can, can you scroll down a bit as the region you, you, are, see, you are displaying or sharing is just the top of the page with Google Docs uh, toolbar and, and these things? So maybe if you scroll a bit down. Um, I will just try the region. Yeah, so, sorry for this. It's, uh, just... it's OK. Uh, Michael reported you should be able to drag the region. We share. Meanwhile, there is a uh, there are really good comments in the in the chat area of this meeting. Back on on what what we are seeing so far. I think I'm just waiting for the Java screen share. Yeah, thing yeah it, it always works out. Or maybe Andrew suggests that uh, if it is a Google Doc, you might be able to export it to PDF and just upload it as a presentation, which might be the other option. Might be quicker. Yeah, maybe meanwhile, you, you might be able to do two things in, in parallel, which I am not. Uh, so I, I got it right that basically it's a framework that uh, activity modules will be will be able to easily plugged in. So if I am a developer of a contributed uh, activity module, I can upgrade it my my module my plugin to support this competency based education and it it would become the part of the whole whole scheme, right? Uh, you don't actually have to make any changes to your plugin, and it will work. Oh. So we've tied it into the mod form, and um, it uses activity completion. So there's uh, right. no changes that are needed, right. and it great. works with all modules. Yep, yeah, that's great. Cool. cool. Okay. I'm just going through the chat if there was some other uh, other question or note. Mm. Okay, so we slides yeah. are uploaded now. Yeah, I can see it nicely now. So that looks a lot better. Okay, so um, so 
Yeah, so we've built the whole thing using web services. So we have this nice API underneath, and then we have a nice set of web services uh, on top of that. And then really to build the whole UI, the whole thing is built with um, uh, mustache templates and AMD modules, and all of the logic about the views and the controllers is all done in the JavaScript AMD modules. Um, so basically, yeah, we just have this uh, API, all, everything that you can do in the interface, uh, you can do through a web service. Um, and the, the front user interface is just 100% built with templates and AMD mm. and just making AJAX calls to the web services. So that means that um, it's great for the mobile app and, and things like that because they can um, uh, they can just reuse all those functions. Can I can I have a question? Uh, yep. Can we can we look at the code that is going to land with uh, in three one and use it as sort of a template or a good you know pattern to use for uh, implementing our own new features like all these you know. AMD mustache and these things. Is it like a yeah, there's, recommended there's heaps, way to to do features now? There's heaps of good examples, particularly of AMD modules in this um, CPE branch. I've got a link at the on the last slide uh, to the code. Um, but one thing that we do have to do uh, before it gets integrated is that we wrote the whole thing as an admin tool. Mm -hmm. um, so it's completely contained within an admin tool. But some of these uh, should be in a core subsystem. So we have a bit of, we're going to be sort of going through the code and deciding what we need to move into core and what we need right. to leave as a plugin um, before it actually gets integrated. But the, but still, there's lots of great examples of AMD modules, which um, we basically, we got better at writing those as we went along, um, especially yep. me and Fred kept reviewing each other's code and telling each other we should do things better and, and making it better and better, which is great. Yeah, yeah, uh, and I must say that having some examples, working examples available is a great or necessary thing to to actually use this new API. So well done and thanks for it. Yep. So uh, just to quickly answer a couple of those questions. Um, you can uh, import competency frameworks. There's no export yet, but you could write a simple tool to do that. Um, I've got some plugins on my GitHub for importing from a couple of different formats um, of competency frameworks. And those plugins are basically examples of how you could write a custom importer as well, um, based on any particular uh, framework format. Um, yep, the code free date is uh, just after the end of March, if I remember. And, uh, so moving on, so some of the challenging things that we had when we were building all this code is that we're using a lot of new systems in Moodle. So uh, we had a lot of learning to do about the best way and um, to use these things, um, which uh, is great. Uh, a lot of another challenge was that the fact that a lot of these uh, learning plans and competent user competencies. Um, uh, exist outside of a course and, and Moodle, a lot of Moodle is sort of built around your doing things inside a course. So um, particularly things like when we're doing queries across user contexts and things like that, were very, very difficult. Um, uh, and also just general, uh, we need to handle thousands and tens of thousands of competencies and uh, tens of thousands of users and make sure that everything scales properly and design the UI so that uh, it's fast and responsive and, and works um, works well for teachers without lots and lots of clicks. Great, great. Um, and this is a, a good thank you list. I can see some of the people on this list in the, in the meeting here. Um, thanks to everyone who's helped. Uh, we've had um, particularly the University of Montreal has been uh, uh, g giving us developer time and they've been helping out because they're, they're really interested in this competency-based education feature and it's, uh, it's great to have their help and it's also great to have their feedback on uh, the design and make sure that it's actually um, uh, meets, meets their needs.
And uh, this is the links to the code and the demos um, and a quick summary of the progress. And uh, I think I'll leave it at that because I've talked for quite a while. Um, but yeah, this should be uh, coming to integration in the next um, few weeks. And thanks again to everyone who's helped work on it. Thank you very much, Damon, for, for this update. Uh, I read it as a great news for, for community developers, both from both points, like there is no need to update our plugins or rewrite our plugins to make use of these new features. And the second news is that uh, this feature comes with a nice examples of actually how to use AMD, Mustache, uh, web services, and all these new frameworks and you know ways to implement things in Moodle. So we can we can look at them, study them, and make use of them in our own code. Excellent. Thank you very much. Guys are are given uh, given links to to follow up on on this. So let us see now. Uh, let us see now what's on agenda next. I will ask Marina to to give us a short overview of two other great features in in Moodle, which is a reusable element for inline name editing and text API changes in three one. So I'm going to pass the microphone to Marina now, and here we go. Can you hear us? Hello, hello, Marina. Hello. Hello, yes, we can hear you now. Oh, wonderful. I'm trying to figure out how to share the screen now. So you should to... be able to, in, you are now presenter, so in the left top corner of the big blue button, there should be a blue rectangle icon to, to share your screen. Yeah, I pressed it and, and then it said, and then screen it, closed yeah, region. It and takes a while then before okay. Java must run and, and these things, so it might take a while. Okay, I just have two screen two monitors, so I wonder if I share full screen for a little bit too much. Yeah, <laughs> it makes things definitely more easier. <laughs> okay, well, while uh, it's loading, I'll post some links here. Uh, so this is the issue when the in place editable was implemented, and this is the uh, documentation. Nothing. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry, I don't see how to share the screen. Or if it uh, if it's something you you could maybe just you know talk about quickly or provide some information so we could study study later if it doesn't work. I think I think I found it. And it's and it's a great all Java pop-ups now. Yeah, Damon just shared in, in the chat that uh, your new your new features, both these reusable element for inline editing and text APR, API are other examples of the new AMD and mustache and templates and these things development. So it's again one area that we can use as a resource for our own uh, for learning how to use these techniques in our own development. And thanks for them. Yeah, uh, can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. Oh, wonderful. Uh, I only needed to agree to about five dialogues. Um, okay, so this uh, came from um, the t new tag management interface that was introduced in 3.0 that probably nobody noticed because nobody uses tags. Uh, but if you can see, there is a um, possibility to change the tags names very quick. 
And somebody asked me after that if they can reuse this code in other areas, and I realized that I made it completely localized for tags. So this um, issue 51 800 to is about moving this um, editing in API, like a mini API from tag area into the core. So it now consists of a template, a JavaScript module, web service, uh, and templatable element. So four elements, and every plugin or core that wants to implement it does need to do it all over again. Um, all they need to do is implement a little callback in the plugin. So the first, the first function in this example is the callback that um, actually does update. And the second part example, uh, it looks on my screen like it's cropped on the left. Is it cropped for you? Pardon, once again? Uh, is it cropped on the left? Is it uh, cut, the left part? A bit, yes. But it still looks readable. It, it, it's OK. Yeah, it's better now. OK. OK. Um, so this is pretty much all that plugin needs to implement mm. or for components in order to make any any I don't know piece of uh, text editable in place. Mm -hmm. uh, one callback and making sure that when you display it, you display it as a template. Well, because if there is some code duplication here, you probably would need another function that actually creates the um, uh, templatable element. So, so would you uh, say, sorry. Yeah, yeah, sure. Would you say that it is uh, intended for like short text, like one line, you know, titles and these things? At the moment, yes. Uh, but, uh, well, it, it cannot work with the uh, rich text editor and sure, sure. There, there should there should be another another module to do that because it needs much more parameters than return values like there is um, sure. files embedded files and stuff like that so this this probably will not happen very soon because I don't even know how to how to start uh, working uh. and I don't have enough projects uh, <clears throat> But uh, this one can be um, can be um, improved to uh, also support drop downs, for example, or autocomplete. Right. Sorry, you you. No, 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 no. Please go on. Okay, so this this text that we actually shared at the moment is uh, in the second link that I sent you the um, um, documentation. Um, at the moment, I only implemented it for the section name. So when you um, inside the course, you can edit the section name very quickly. No, oh, that's good. One. Okay. Uh, but um, link to five one eight or two. Uh, there are a couple of other issues where I tried to edit. There. Yes, uh, activity names and quiz editing use different, similar looking but different uh, codes, so they will need to be converted to this one. I can see a real big potential for a lot of places around that you normally you would open the whole form to edit one, just one field. Whereas this new element can really improve, you know, the whole usability of many information there, where a teacher just wants to quickly edit just one little place here and there. And yeah, this is great to have such a such an option. Yeah, so it was integrated today, um, will be available from uh, Friday Yuppie. in Master. So everybody's welcome to use it in core on plugins. Uh, Another thing I wanted to, if, uh, if I can move on, there are any questions about this one? This is really a small element, so not very much to talk about. There's a lot of code that you don't need to write if you want to. Yeah, that's good. That's good. 
you made all the hard work for us. Yep, so, and it was a very big discussion. We uh, started talking about hooks again because the web service uses callbacks, so it calls the function from the plugin or from call component to actually update the element. So it's sort of like a hook. Uh, and mm. we started talking about all these hooks again, and I don't know if you follow the um, forum discussions or the issues. Maybe, maybe it will finally facilitate us to do something in the direction of hooks. Yeah, it could evolve into some, you know, even more general or something like that. So okay. would you like to talk about the Tex API as well? The Tex API, yes, yes, sure. It's uh, not really related, but um, uh, this was also inspired by uh, CBE because they wanted to have um, tagging of the uh, competencies that are not mixed with any other tags in the system. So they just have a separate, let's call it collection of tags that uh, is used only by competencies. So this um, uh, so this issue five. 0851 was integrated, I think, about a month ago. Uh, introduces tag collections. So the, uh, in the interface for admin, if you go to the Manage Tags page, first of all, you can see that you can enable or disable each. Well, first of all, you can see all areas that can be tagged in Moodle or currently. Then you can disable or enable each one separately. And also you can add tag collections and separate, um, for example, user interest from course tags or make them completely independent. So when you click on tags in user interest, you only see other users. You don't see other courses that are not tagged with this um, tag. But um, another suggestion that came from Helen is to rename official tags, what we used to call them 3.0 and before, uh, to be standard tags. So this is the second. Well, this is mostly UI. No, it's, it's, uh, it's UI and database change. The official tags are now called standard tags. Mm -hmm. and, um, and since I had to change like two thirds of the tag related functions, uh, there was another suggestion by Andrew to just duplicate all the remaining old tag API functions and just move completely to the new API hmm. object, object oriented. So if you used tags before, you will definitely have to rewrite like lots of code because we duplicated all the tag functions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they but still it, they still work, but with deprecation yeah. messages. Well done, Marina. These are great great improvements, and once again, I can I can see a lot of places where this can maybe use. Yeah, I only I want to show you how the uh, new tag uh -huh. page looks. So. Let me move this again, the screen. So you have, um, everything is, uh, looks similar, courses, blog posts, user interest. And if you want to scroll courses, they're loaded by Ajax, and more, more courses or more users. They just scroll by Ajax. And the uh, most important thing that each plugin or another company that wants to implement new, um, their own tag area, they can uh, implement callback that will display uh, items tag that display mm -hmm, mm -hmm, component mm -hmm. on this page. This is something that was not present before, so it was all hard coded nice. all in tag index.php. So I hope that uh, we will um, add searching of the wiki pages uh, and question tags on this screen before 3.1 release. And I will make sure to write better documentation about those notes. 
develop this documentation about it yet. Great. Looking good. And we will hopefully use it for plugins directory in Moodle.org. Yeah, psh, it's a secret. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. No, there, there is a real, uh, there is a long, long-term plan to to start using, to start using similar features like tagging or labeling for plugins and uh, making making use of it to organize plugins in in various ways. So yes, we've been looking forward, looking for and looking for this these changes in in the core. Thank you very much. Yeah, and another last thing that everything is now in templates, so tag cloud, tag feed, uh, tag list. They are all uh, mustache templates. Yep. Can be customized, I think. Great. Okay, how thank you. you. How did yeah. you find these these new APIs? You know, how is it for, um, for you as a developer to, to work with these? AMD mustache templates and everything. Just personal feelings. Um, well, I have Damien sitting in the next room for me, so I can ask at any moment. <laughs> it makes it easier. <laughs> yes, yeah. and and also if I report the bugs while while I'm developing, he fixes them very quickly. Yeah. This is also good. <laughs> I must say, you know, my first impressions were that it's pretty complex and huge but at the end when, once you realize uh, all the possibilities that are then uh, presented by by using these like you know implicit support for Moodle app and for other apps and external systems and everything that comes as a side product actually of this of these uh, techniques or APIs is awesome it's like it's really great and also we I now make JavaScript modules written in jQuery instead of Fury, and I love yeah. it so much. And and it's like everything I don't know how to do in jQuery. I just Google it, and somebody had asked exactly the same question, and hundreds of people answered it, and it's on Stack Overflow. I'm sorry, yeah. Andrew. I, I knew I knew <laughs> you would be upset by that, but. Making JavaScript code in jQuery is about like five times faster than you use. Great to hear. Great to hear. <laughs> Thanks, Marina, for your feedback and for, for this update. Uh, Thank you. We will not actually jump that far with, with the topic as I'm going to ask Adrian for, for some short information and update on how, how to use or how uh, handling with uh, Moodle Forms library can be was com is compatible with these new APIs and new approaches to to user interface development. So can can you hear us, Adrian? Hello, can you hear me? Hello, we can. Uh, okay, just need to find where my slide is. I guess if you click on that, the same icon you used to upload it in the left bottom corner of the presentation window, there should be a, yeah, that's it. Great. Uh, okay. So let's move on to the. Um, at HQ, we've been very busy trying to figure out how we can um, make forms work with Ajax. Uh, and so the most recent development has been with creating an AMD module uh, to load fragments. Uh, so this means that you can create your forms uh, using the old mForms library uh, and then using um, uh, a fragment and creating a callback, you can fetch your uh, HTML um, and then move it into whatever uh, page or node or wherever you want to put it. So um, this makes uh, creating forms uh, fairly simple if you're used to creating forms with an M form. Uh, so at the moment, uh, part of this has landed. Um, a couple of improvements to the actual uh, API uh, 
uh, seem to follow. Um, so uh, what we have at the moment is this uh, fragment.js, it's an AMD module. Uh, what you do is you um, point to the component um, that you want to get your callback from, the callback name, uh, you need to provide a context ID, uh, and all the parameters for the callback uh, go in there as well. So um, here we've got a simple example of the modest sign um, and getting the information for the grading page. Um, and then uh, that goes off and it call, like goes to the callback that you create um, and then uh, you send back HTML, preferably through a renderer, and then you get back both HTML and JavaScript. And then it's uh, the developer's responsibility to put that in the page where they want to put it. Uh, uh, yeah, the fragment JS itself is using uh, Core Ajax. Um, yeah, it's called a it's web service. Uh, but you won't actually have to worry about that. All you have to do is call the fragment.js and then it will handle all of the J, uh, Ajax requests there. So the callback, um, at the moment, uh, you have your location uh, for the uh, component and then in the library you put your uh, function name there and it needs to have the output fragment in that sort of uh, uh, format they have uh, listed on this uh, screen there. Um, and then uh, you have to have your callback return your HTML of some sort. So uh, this works with M forms, text editors, filters, and other fancy URI modules such as edit PDF. Uh, oh. Here I've got an example. Uh, I can't actually really read this myself, so my apologies if you can't read this. Um, but we'll we'll put this up on the uh, on this document up so you can have a look. Oh, that's, that's not great. All right. Um, yeah, just a very simple diagram as to how it works. Uh, you have your you have your form, and you, uh, you click the button, this listener gets fired, um, it calls the load fragment uh, with all your information, uh, it goes off to the callback, uh, returns all the information uh, about the HTML and the JavaScript. Um, we suggest that you use the template.replace node content, uh, which does a bit of tidying up and make sure that all of the uh, uh, filters um, are ready to go. And then you insert the uh, form and the JavaScript into the page. Uh, so yeah, pretty uh, pretty simple diagram. Um, obviously, this is just one example of what you could do. Um, another one, you could have a pop-up window and then load your information into it that way. Uh, yeah, possibilities are almost limitless. So uh, if you want more information, um, we have these uh, we have these uh, MDL issues, uh, first ones integrated. Um, and at the moment, it's being used by the assignment grading interface improvements. Um, this is something that Damien has been very busy working on. Uh, I can actually give you a demonstration of that working using the fragment. Um, so I might try to go to uh, full screen and see if I can show that to you. So if I uh, if I get it correctly, meanwhile, it, this can be uh, this could be used for you know things like let's say uh, when I'm again looking at some screen and I would like to modify something or let's say uh, load standard Moodle form without the full uh, full page load like to fetch just the just the Visivic editor or something like. I could use this new framework and it would make sure of all the HTML and JavaScript being loaded and executed. Uh, yeah, that's correct. Um, it it uh, uh, does a lot of stuff in the background that captures all of the JavaScript that goes with yeah. the 
the information on the M form, and uh, that allows stuff such as editors to be uh, uh, to work properly um, yep. when they're inserted so onto the page. Uh, can you see this screen? We can, yes. Okay. Um, so th this is an assignment. I think, well, it's a bit slow. Okay, uh, everybody should be fairly familiar with this screen. And this that's slowly rendering in is the concept for the new uh, assignment grader. So. Okay. Uh, we have the PDF on the left, uh, the user at the top, and the grading uh, on the side. So this file submission is actually a Word document, which is being converted to a PDF. Uh, this allows you to annotate the PDF on the left-hand side for feedback. Uh, as you can see here, we are using a rubric, and this is working just fine. Um, and we have our editor here, which is also working. Um, so I'll just save this. And move to the next user. Right. So yeah, this is this is what can be done with the uh, the new fragment A and B yep, module. Good. Really good. Again, I, I can see a lot of potential to to extend our existing user interfaces to to make them you know more uh, more immediate, more more instant for editing changes and improvements. Thanks a lot for for your work on, on this, Adrian. It's great that we are we were still able to uh, to keep this old and legacy these days forms API and still being able to, to use it for for new user interfaces design. It would be probably best to start from scratch, but that's not how things are, are done and we could spend ages just on, on it. So it's great to have this option now. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so what we have now, last not least, is, uh, is Tim Hunt from the Open University in Great Britain. Tim would, uh, Tim offered, or Tim is going to join us to present some uh, some recent changes in the quiz module that he's maintainer of. I just made you a presenter, Tim. Hello. Yep. Um, so I need to find my presentation. Sure. Um, show that one. Yes, so, we have. Um, I should say, when I added this to the list of what to talk about, when the list was looking very, very short, and I was worried David might be scared, he had to talk for 90 minutes himself. So this um, is barely worth saying, but I'll go through it quite quickly. Um, no worries. The, the reason we, we've changed a bit of user interface in the quiz, which I hope everyone thinks is better, uh, and um, the reason to mention it actually is some of these changes we put into the stable branch because um, it seemed it probably wouldn't break anyone's themes. So um, this first one is going into Moodle 3.1 only. Uh, it's when a student starts a quiz. In the past, there used to be a separate pop-up if the quiz had a time limit or there were a limited number of attempts to warn them before they started. And then if the quiz had a password or if they were using one of the other quiz access rules, like um, got one at the Open University where it pops up a statement for the student to tick a box to say they're not going to cheat, that would um, load in a separate um, page and only then would you get to the quiz attempt. So now all this stuff 
is um, on a single page, in a single pop-up, so it's all just easier to start a quiz. Um, so that, as I say, is Moodle 3.1 only. Um, this renderer change, I am pretty sure, is Moodle 3.1 only. Yes, it is. So just for consistency now as well, there always used to be a next button, which used to be on the left. Now we have a previous and a next button. So it's a bit more like the links you get in forum posts. Um, so again, just be aware that's changed. And this is the major one. And we did put this into the stable branches, if I remember correctly. Did we? Oh, I can't remember. Check the tracker. Um, I've got a list of tracker issues at the end. Um, in Moodle 2.9, we added this optional redo question feature. And the button, for some reason, we put it in a stupid place. And um, who's the French translator? Pointed out that if you translate redo questions too long, it doesn't fit. So we moved it to a more sensible place. Um, so basically, oh, there are a few minor renderer changes, uh, but they are all documented in upgrade.txt. So uh, usual way, um, should, shouldn't be a big problem for anyone. I just thought I'd mention it in case it did cause problems for anyone. So that's me. Next person. Hello. Hi. I'm done. You need the next person. It was pretty quick. I was uh, <laughs> I was uh, shocked. I'm still expecting something. Uh, something. Sorry, I should, should have given you slightly longer for your nap. Pardon, I, I just lost it for a while. So the the feedback looks looks great. Uh, we we like this uh, this improvement. And is there some particular particular actions needed to be done by theme designers on the on their side? I think just if you have overridden the quiz renderer, make sure right. you read upgrade.txt, and I'm sure we'll put anything important in the release notes. Great. Um, yeah. So Martin, um, back to my first slide. If you want to know why we made these UI changes, come and hear about the work we've been doing on our OU Moodle site at the UK Moodle Moot. Yeah, great. So it was uh, an outcome of some uh, user group or something like that? We've been and doing a big Moodle usability review and creating a new yeah. theme. And these right. are just a few, few small changes in the quiz we've done. But these are the ones that got into Moodle Core. That reminds me, when, when you mentioned these, uh, this move of the button you know, previous to the left and next to the right, oh. these are exactly the usability or user interface pattern that's, that we should, uh, we should somehow agree on mm. and make them consistently across the whole Moodle. That, that, when I was help. looking at this, I did notice in the book module, you've got yeah. previous and next li links that are done in a completely different way. Yeah. So again, maybe some, some sort of uh, reusable elements, you know, for navigation, <laughs> next graph, and, and these things. Or, or maybe just... Oh, uh, no, where have uh, I had this idea before? I, I don't think we need to go that far, actually, to, to have some, you know, shared elements, but just sort of policy or, you know, I mean, uh, uh, recommendations on how to do the certain parts of the UI might be, might be good. So this is a great contribution to such, uh, such a discussion or, or a project. Great. I'm just checking the comments if there is some, some question yet. Oh, I don't think so. Thank you very much, Tim, for keeping us uh, updated or uh, up to date with uh, quiz development. Thank you very much for your work on it, by the way. It's great to have it, uh, have it maintained it by, uh, by you and the whole Open University team. 
actually some of those changes um, we talked about at the Moodle Moot in Dublin about two years ago, and I've only just got around to writing the code for these good ideas. <laughs> just in time I'm... before before going to London then. Okay, so let me ask uh, Juan Ligavana for for his for his talk about. Here we go about uh, the plans for supporting Moodle plugins in the mobile app, which should again which should again uh, open open the mobile app for more contributions and more uh, extending. So Juan, you are now presenter, and you can upload your presentation and. Uh, Thank you. You're welcome. So I suppose you can hear me well, right? Yes, we can. Okay. So well, uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, our plans for uh, supporting uh, mobile plugins in the mobile application. That, that this is something that we've been uh, thinking about recently. Well, not recently. It was planned for Moodle 3.0. But uh, we we didn't have time to implement this because it's it's quite complex in some areas areas that requires changes in in, in Moodle Core. So, uh, so first of all, um, we, we need a bit of nomenclature here uh, because you know we, we are going to we are going to uh, be talking about um, Moodle plugins and mobile add-ons. So I think that this this is necess necessary to don't get confused. So when in my presentation I'm going to talk about Moodle plugins, but I'm referring to additional contributed plugins. Okay, like the certificate, questionnaire, uh, progress bar, etc. So um, uh, if for the mobile add-on. Uh, what, 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 when we are talking about mobile add-ons, uh, I'm referring to uh, Angular modules that enhances the app functionality. Okay, so uh, we we don't have uh, different types of add-ons. We just have uh, we just have one type, that's mobile mobile add-on, and it can register itself in in another component in the mobile app like the site menu, the user profile page, or, or course. So um, the Moodle mobile architecture, uh, we have a core component that are required by the app to work, like a course, course uh, user settings. And we have also uh, add-ons. That is something that is a com is like a component, but it can be removed from the application, and the application is going to still work without without that that add-on. Okay, like the forum, calendar, or grades. So um, a Moodle mobile add-on can be a Moodle core plugin or a Moodle subsystem. Okay. So new Moodle subsystem like CBE will be added as an add-on in, in Moodle Mobile. So I know that this may sound like quite confusing, but it's how it is. <laughs> and and the app add-ons require services to communicate with Moodle. That's how the application mostly work. We use a lot of web services to communicate with, with, with Moodle. So we can send and receive data from from Moodle. Mm -hmm. So the big question now: so how are you going to support uh, additional Moodle plugins? Well, um, the plugin itself will contain a Moodle mobile add-on. So for certificate, for example, a random sample. Um, it will contain um, a zip file or a folder with um, um, a mobile app at home. And we all, we, maybe we can use a, a, a new mobile.php file 
uh, where we de will where we will declare all the patches that this um, Moodle plugin is exporting to the mobile application. Okay. So um, in this case, the mod certificate will require uh, an additional web service, well, a set of web services, because if we want to be able to talk with uh, Moodle from the mobile application, we, we need this. This is the only way we can interchange data. And uh, these new uh, web services that are published by this um, plugin, this Moodle plugin, will be injected in the mobile official service. Okay, so um, basically our plan is that uh, Moodle plugin will contain everything that needs the mobile application to deploy this 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 plugin as a tool in the mobile application. Sorry, it's, it's quite confusing, but that's the idea. So how how this will work in the mobile application? The, the mobile application will det detect if with which mobile appliance exports mobile add-ons, and will download and lazy load them into the app at run at run, run time. So this means that when a user and uh, act at a new site, will we we will be able to know uh, which uh, Moodle plugins extra additional Moodle plugins are supported, and we will download it if they weren't previously loaded, and we will lazy load it in the mobile application. So uh, Damien is doing a, a very good question. And well, you're wrong. Sorry, this this was already uh, approved and is is in in this section in in the Apple Developer Program Agreement. It wasn't, Sam. Sorry. <laughs> so we have a couple of products already using this. So we have Ionic Framework Deploy Service that it allows you to up, um, upgrade. A new version of of your app without having to publish it in in the in the in the store. This is quite interesting because if you want to um, deliver a quick fix, you don't have to wait the seven days that usually Apple um, uh, has, needs to do the review. So uh, we have also IBM World like doing this. Well, with Android, it's not going to be a problem because. Android directly they they don't review the app, so you can find every everything. They need. So it's, they have some automatic processes. But it's okay with them. And as I said before, it's something that that your framework is doing right now. So uh, what type of mobiles will be supported? Um, it could be any any type, including suppliers. Um, as I said before, mobile add-ons can re register themselves in any area of the app with handlers like the sign a new user profile, course content, etc. Et For example, um, the progress bar blog that you know in Moodle is, is, is just a blog will be able to create a new menu option, the site menu or the user profile or the course menu in everywhere, because we have handlers for, for, for almost everything. And what happens with plugins like, well, this question type, squeeze access rules, uh, assignment submissions, you know, this type of sub plugins that, that may um, have some effect on how you display the the activity, well, we will have a sp a special handlers handlers for for that. Um, um, it will be the same. They will be able to inject some special code via ha uh, hooks or whatever, so they can render the additional options required in in the in in the mobile 
the phrase. So this will require some Moodle core changes. Um, you have the use numbers there. So um, first of all, it's the most important is that uh, we, we need to allow plugins and plugins to inject web services in core and other services. Really, you, you, you cannot just do that because um, the mobile service is built in. It means that every time you um, upgrade uh, Moodle, it's, um, it deletes and adds the only the, um, the web services that are listed in the DB services.php file. So you don't you can you can insert new web services directly in the web in the in the database, but they are going to be removed every time every time you upgrade Moodle. So we need to find a way to allow a uh, third party uh, uh, well uh, additional plugins or sub plugins to inject new new web services in, in the official mobile service. Well, the, the mobile services is like a set of web services that are available for the mobile application. Okay, so they have to be listed there. And second, well, we have to implement uh, what they said, uh, this mobile.php uh, new file and the patch, patch um, uploading and, and, and everything. So that's all. Thank you. If you have any question, please. Thank you very much, Juan. There was uh, there was a question, some questions in in the comments. Basically, what would be the process of if I am a uh, say a developer or maintainer of a contributed plugin like question practice, like Tim mentions? Uh, where should I start? Where where should I start with converting the plugin so that it can be used by the mobile app as an own. Um, Just a you know hint or for first steps or something. Well, that's a good question because we 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 was today this discussing that with with in the tracker. For example, we are um, in the mobile application. We are going to support um, the questions like a core component or something like that. So um, this type of activities can be um, can be uh, supported in the mobile application. Uh, I, I don't think if, uh, it's not converting uh, what, what you have to, to do. You have to create a new mobile, a new Moodle mm -hmm. mobile um, admin that is basically create an Angular GS model with templates, models, um, and everything. So mm -hmm. that's that's the point. Is I, I it's a lot of work for for uh, I must say this this is it's work for 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 additional plugins developers. But in, in some cases, it, it will be very good to have this this like certificate. For example, it can it, be, it can be quite simple. Just like uh, allow to download. The certificate in, in the mobile application. So yeah. sometimes it's going to be more complex, or uh, but sometimes it, it can be really easy. And we will uh, create documentation. We will support this in the forum forums, and maybe we we, we can create a couple of examples of the most downloaded plugins, something like that. Mm -hmm. Great. You know, I don't review. I don't. <laughs> I won't review then all, Fred. <laughs> okay, there was uh, there was some other discussions and questions about you know the combinations of uh, or versions of these plugins, mobile plugins, whether they will be stored in the mobile app per site or globally for or uh, or a site. It's per per site per site. Per site. We we will try to. Uh, use hashed values so we can, um, if the line with the same hash version is yep. already stored, we can reuse it, but it will be per, per site. Yep, yep, like content addressable storage. Uh, there was, I, I had this idea, uh, wanted to, I, I'm going to use 
um, or make use of this opportunity that we have our mobile app expert here. Uh, my feeling when I was experimenting with these AMD mustache templates, web services, and these things for plugin development, I, I had this feeling that if I'm, if I'm using these intensively for UI, for functionality, for everything, then uh, actually supporting my plugin from the mobile app would be, should be much easier because the web services, the interface will be already there. So it will be, it should be there just a matter of some, uh, you know, communication and these things. Can you confirm this? Yes, if, if you are if you are getting new plugins using this approach, they, uh, well, this new approach with web services, templates, and everything, it should be easier to um, okay. to migrate because um, you can reuse the templates code mostly for some areas. Well, I, I mean, it, 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 will, it will need some Ionic specific styles. Sure. But you can reuse some parts or parts of of the code. So with this new approach, for example, it should be very easy for us to to add to display uh, the CBE new feature in your mobile yeah. application. But that's what what I realized that as these APIs actually force you to think in terms of data structure and how they are passed to client at the back then it doesn't matter that much whether the client is actually web browser or the mobile app. So the, the, the plugin itself exposes its functionality via web service and then it doesn't matter what client is used to actually use them. So it should be, uh, it should be better. Good. Thank you very much Juan for this update and thank you very much for your ongoing work with Moodle mobile app development. It's great to see and we also got a great feedback from our Learn Moodle uh, participants, Learn Moodle MOOC, the, who found uh, their mobile app actually very useful for, for, for the course. So well done and thanks. Okay then, uh, that's all from the agenda. If there is, uh, there is anything somebody would like to mention or set or something like that, please shout now in the in the comments. Yes, I guess this will be the end of the meeting then. Thank you very much everybody for coming. See you in very least in three months again well, in the next uh, next community meeting or anytime before at, in London for the Hackfest or anywhere. Thank you very much for coming and see you next time. Bye.